Hello and a very warm welcome. You're watching Gravitas. My name is Molly Gambhir. Let's get started. Shinzo Abe, Japan's longest serving prime minister, is no more. He was shot at during an election event in an attack that has left Japan and the entire world in a state of shock. Gun violence is extremely rare in Japan, and that's another reason why this incident is particularly shocking. A champion of economic reforms or Abenomics, he has been credited with charting Japan's economic growth the pioneer of Cord, a leader who forged key diplomatic relationships while weathering scandals. Abe was a special friend to India. He was a symbol of change and a defender of democracy. On Gravitas tonight, we take a look back at Shinzo Abe's legacy. It is a tragedy that has stunned the world. Former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is no more. He was shot during a political rally. This is how it happened. As you heard, there were two gunshots. The first one missed Shinzo Abe, the second one did not. Shinzo Abe quickly collapsed on the ground. He was in the southern city of Nara. Japan is about to hold elections for the upper house. Abe was campaigning for a candidate. He was shot from behind. The shooter was caught immediately. This was the moment security forces guarding Abe quickly neutralized him. His name is Tetsuwa Yamagami. He is 41 years old. Yamagami was a member of Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force. He is said to have left active service in 2005. He was dissatisfied with the former prime minister and he wanted to kill him. There is little that the world knows about him beyond this. But some reports have emerged. The local police found explosives and multiple handmade weapons from the shooter's home. They say the shooter had a grudge against a specific organization that Abe was a part of. The police has not named the organization. And this is the weapon that was allegedly used to attack Abe. It looks like an improvised gun. How did the shooter manage to get so close to Shinzo Abe? We don't know yet. Shinzo Abe did have a security team, but the gunman still managed to get close to him. There were eyewitnesses who saw him. Abe suffered two bullet wounds to his neck. His heart was also damaged. He was airlifted to the Nara Medical University Hospital, but there was little that the doctors could do. 
he was transported to the emergency center of the Nara Medical University at 12.20 p.m. and was in cardiorespiratory arrest. We tried to resuscitate him at the emergency center, but unfortunately, he passed away at 5.03 p.m. Soon after that, the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida spoke out. Kishida had the support of Abe when he won the leadership contest. Kishida held back tears when he spoke to the media. He called the assassination an unforgivable act. I was desperately praying for him to survive, but unfortunately that prayer was not answered. And we now face this sad news. I have no words. I would like to express my deep condolences. A 90-member task force is now investigating the assassination. The election to the upper house is on Sunday. It will go ahead as planned. But major parties and cabinet ministers have cancelled their campaign events. World leaders are paying a tribute to Shinzo Abe. The spokesperson of the Kremlin has spoken out. Russia has called Shinzo Abe a patriot. United States President Joe Biden spoke out as well. He said he is stunned, outraged and deeply saddened. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi also issued a statement. He said, and I'm quoting, I'm shocked and saddened beyond words at the tragic demise of one of my dearest friends, Shinzo Abe. He was a towering global, spa global statesman, an outstanding leader and a remarkable administrator. He dedicated his life to make Japan and the world a better place. Abaji, mere to saathi the hi. वो भारत के भी उतने ही विश्वसनीय दोस्त थे उनके कार्यकाल में भारत जापान में उनके जो राजनीतिक संबंध थे हमारे वो को नई ऊंचाई तो मिली ही हमने दोनों देशों की सांझी विरासत से जुड़े रिश्तों को भी खूब आगे बढ़ाया आज भारत के विकास की जो गति है जापान के सहयोग से हमारे यहां जो कार्य हो रहे हैं इनके जरिए सिंजो आबे जी भारत के जनमन में सालों तक बसे रहेंगे इंडिया विल ऑब्जर्व अ वन डे नेशनल मॉर्निंग ऑन सैटरडे India's national flag will be flown at half-mast. Japan and the entire world in a state of shock. Shinzo Abe was Japan's longest-serving prime minister. He has a lot of achievements to his credit. Abe tried to shape a new identity for Japan. He initiated Japan's shift away from pacifism. His economic policy called Abenomics had some success in reversing Japan's deflation. Abe was a pioneer of the court, the alliance of India, Japan, Australia and the United States. Abe's efforts turned the idea into a real alliance. He left office in 2020 because of illness, but Abe still remained an influential figure in Japanese politics. His legacy spans nearly four decades. Abe entered active politics way back in 1982. Forty years later, he was still on the campaign trail and during this time, he went through a lot. From political setbacks, to medical issues, to policy criticism, but through all of it, Shinzo Abe never compromised. Here's a look back at the life and times of Japan's longest serving leader. December 2012, Japan is in political turmoil. Five prime ministers have come and gone since 2007. None lasted more than 16 months. The Japanese people want stability more than anything. And one leader promised them exactly that. I want to bring Japan back to the place where Japanese people and Japanese children who were born in this country can feel proud that they were born here. The voters agreed. What followed was a transformational premiership, one that stretched from 2012 to 2020. 
In this time, Abe changed Japan's political and economic journey. He was a nationalist, he was a reformist, and to some, he was controversial. Abe was born in Tokyo in 1954. He came from Japanese political royalty. His father served as the foreign minister in the 1980s. His grandfather was prime minister in the late 50s. In 1977, Abe graduated from Tokyo Seiki University. He then moved to the United States to study public policy. Two years later, he joined the workforce. Steel companies were all the rage back then, so Abe joined Kobe Steel. But the corporate romance wouldn't last long. In 1982, he officially entered politics. Abe's first assignment was with his father. He pursued various positions, both in the foreign ministry and the Liberal Democratic Party. But electoral success would have to wait. It came almost 11 years later in 1993. Abe was elected as an LDP lawmaker. He was now set on the path to political greatness. In 2005, Abe got another big break. He was appointed Chief Cabinet Secretary by the Prime Minister, a powerful position in Japan's government. This appointment put him next in line for the Premiership. One year later, he did just that. As Prime Minister, Abe implemented his conservative policies. This included economic reforms, a tougher stance against North Korea, and seeking a reset with the South. In his second stint, these policies would be rebranded as Abenomics, but in 2006, they were still a work in progress. For a rising political scion, Abe's first stint was underwhelming. His party lost control of the parliament, his government was hit by a series of scandals, and his approval ratings plunged to 30%. By now, Abe was struggling with another challenge, one that would haunt him again in 2020. Ulcerative colitis, an inflammatory bowel disease, citing health reasons, Abe stepped down. His premiership lasted all of one year and one day. Abe's first term may have ended prematurely, but one contribution stands out from that period, his reinvention of the Quad. Abe spelled out his vision for the Indo-Pacific in 2007. He was addressing the Indian Parliament. The Pacific and the Indian Oceans are now bringing about a dynamic coupling as seas of freedom and of prosperity. A broader Asia that broke away geographical boundaries is now beginning to take on a distinct form. With that, Quad 2.0 was born. A more resilient, a more aggressive, and a more focused Quad. Their first joint military drills would be held in April 2007. The first meeting would follow the next month. Health issues could not keep Abe down for long. In 2012, he made a comeback, storming to party leadership, and then to the Prime Minister's office. This time, he was there to stay. Abe would go on to win two landslide elections, once in 2014 and again in 2017. In his second term, Abe was a lot more decisive. His focus was on the economy and security. Abe fought for a loose monetary policy. He pushed for fiscal stimulus. And he unveiled structural economic reforms. Analysts dubbed it Abenomics. Abe jolted Japan out of its pacifist leaning. He emerged as a foreign policy hawk, openly talking about rethinking Japan's security policy. What's necessary is a pragmatic action plan based on reality and the establishment of a jurisdictional basis to back it up. That's all. I will push forward to re-establish Japan's security policy based on reality. He wanted to rewrite Article 9 of Japan's constitution. This article outlaws war, 
It prevents Japan from raising standing armies or building missiles. But Abe saw this as a handicap. He sensed the rising challenges from China and North Korea. So Abe promised to tweak pacifism to balance self-defense and peace. And that will forever be Abe's greatest legacy. He convinced a nation scarred by nuclear weapons that self-defense is important. He wanted Japan to spend 2% of its GDP on defense. It was unthinkable before Abe's time, but today it is official government policy. Abe's hawkishness has earned him criticism too. In 2013, he visited the Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo. It is a controversial memorial to Japan's World War II leaders, many of whom were war criminals. He also presided over souring ties with South Korea. Abe was accused of playing down Japan's colonial crimes in the Korean Peninsula. In 2020, Abe's health issues surfaced again. He stepped down as prime minister. His biggest regret? Not being able to host the Tokyo Olympics. Tokyo! Tokyo! It was Abe who led Japan's Olympic campaign. But the COVID-19 pandemic denied him the chance to see it through. A setback for sure, but a mere speck in Abe's towering career. Longest serving prime minister, youngest post-war prime minister, first prime minister born after World War II. These are just some of the records etched to Abe's name. Over four decades, he scaled the heights of Japanese politics, and there he will forever remain. Bureau Report, We On, World Is One. Joining us on the broadcast this minute is Kuichiro Matsumoto. He serves as the Deputy Cabinet Secretary for Public Affairs in the Prime Minister's Office in Japan. Thanks very much for being here with us. How would you describe the legacy that Shinzo Abe leaves behind? Yes, um, he was the longest serving Prime Minister of Japan, uh, one of the most prominent uh, leaders of our time uh, Japan uh, probably has ever had. Uh, not only in Japan, that is felt not only in Japan, uh, but around the world. Uh, among uh, those leaders he met, uh, he was held in high uh, regard for his um, deep commitment to diplomacy, economy, uh, national security. Uh, and uh, uh, you heard, probably we heard uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, saying that uh, Prime Minister uh, Abe, former Prime Minister Abe, led Japan with uh, his magnificent uh, leadership. Uh, and uh, also he was a very strong believer of Japan as a nation. Uh, he helped his nation uh, recover economically uh, through his policy package called the Abenomics. Uh, flexible fiscal policy, aggressive monetary policy, and the growth strategy. Uh, and this sowed the seeds for an economic recovery that we are enjoying at, uh, at the moment. And if I may carry on, uh, he was very eager to uh, upgrade Japan's uh, defense capability uh, and the security legislation in light of deteriorating uh, uh, security environment uh, in East Asia. Uh, and uh, he came up with this enactment of peace and security legislation and also founded the National Security Secretariat, which is equivalent to uh, NSC in the United States. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, well, we shouldn't forget also that uh, he was uh, also a champion of gender equality, uh, uh, putting in place uh, corporate governance codes and uh, encouraging Japanese companies uh, to be more, uh, to encourage more, uh, more of a diversity in the business in Japan. And you have worked closely with Shinzo Abe. Uh, which qualities of the leader stand out for you when you look back at the time that you spent with him? Uh, 
Well, he's a very decisive person and he was full of ideas. Uh, full of ideas, I mean that uh, he came up with this uh, amazing idea of a free and open in the Pacific that became the linchpin of our diplomatic initiatives. And that really, that really sort of uh, embraced all the countries in Indo-Pacific, not only uh, the countries who are uh, in the, uh, which are in the Indo-Pacific, but also the European uh, countries. So for example, Germany, uh, United Kingdom, uh, and uh, France came up with the uh, Indo-Pacific initiative as their national strategy. And uh, if you can, if you remember very well, uh, the headquarters in Hawaii, uh, in the US uh, uh, um, uh, military base, this was called uh, uh, Pacific Command. But because uh, ever since uh, Prime Minister Abe advocated the initiative of free and open Indo-Pacific, they changed the name to Indo-PACOM, Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, so there was a kind of a, uh, well, uh, he was rich in his uh, ideas uh, and he knew exactly what geopolitics is all about. How do you view Shinzo Abe's contribution in shaping Japan's strategic posture and the country's relationship with India? He was extremely uh, fond of India. Uh, as a country and Indian people. Um, uh, he was an uh, uh, earnest believer of Japan-India relations. Uh, he, uh, well, his uh, close and cordial relationship with Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi of India uh, is very well known. And I think many of your viewers uh, do know how deeply uh, he believes in the, uh, the relationship between the two countries and the two leaders. And also, uh, the fact that he advocated free and open in the Pacific is quite telling uh, because um, he said, well, Indo-Pacific as an ocean and the uh, entire area should be viewed as a uh, uh, public goods for the international community. And uh, he always believed in the freeness, uh, freedom and openness uh, of this area because this will uh, enable us to have a prosperous Asia and that is going to be the Koichiro Matsumoto, thanks very much for being here on the broadcast on this difficulty. Now, here's what makes this assassination all the more shocking, the very unlikelihood of it. Shinzo Abe was assassinated in Japan, a country with one of the lowest rates of gun violence. I'm talking about a country of 125 million people. In 2021, Japan saw 10 shooting incidents. Eight involved gangsters, one person was killed, four injured. Have a look at the numbers from 2018. Nine were killed with firearms in Japan. The United States, in comparison, had over 39,000 gun deaths that year. You get my point. Gun terror is uncommon in Japan, and a former prime minister being assassinated by a gun, unthinkable. The incident does not add up numerically, historically, culturally, or even legally. Japan has close to zero tolerance when it comes to gun ownership. Let me show you some numbers. The country of 125 million has around 377,000 privately held guns, which adds up to 0.25 guns per 100 people. Getting hold of a gun in Japan is not only a difficult process, it's also a lengthy one. A person needs to clear 13 steps before he or she can own a gun. It starts with a firearm class, involves passing a written test, mental fitness test, getting a clean shit on drug dependence, taking a course on using and storing a gun. And then there are police interviews of the applicant, the family, also neighbors. There are background checks as well. Authorities also consider employment history, bank balance. Even after all of these steps, a person must get a gunpowder permit, buy a gun locker, go through another round of background checks, and then finally get a firearm. So long story short, it's not easy to get hold of a gun. Possessing a gun is also not desirable. Like I said, the country has around 377,000 privately held guns, which adds up to 0.25 guns per 100 people. The United States, in comparison, has 120 guns per 100 people. 
The United States also has a history of high-profile assassinations. Four presidents and former presidents have been shot dead. Abraham Lincoln, James Garfield, William McKinley, and more recently, John F. Kennedy. The sitting president was shot while he was driving past in a convertible in downtown Dallas. His car was a part of the presidential motorgate. He was rushed to the hospital. Kennedy died within 20 minutes. But incidents like these don't usually happen in Japan. The last time a prime minister was killed was in the 1930s. Post-war Japan has stayed away from firearms as much as possible. The country's tight checks on guns are rooted in the very idea of pacifism. Even today, the Japanese law in principle prohibits the possession of firearms. While there have been few incidents of shootings, they mostly involve gangsters using illegal firearms. Attacks on political leaders are far and few. The only political leader to be shot at in recent history was the mayor of Nagasaki. His name was Echo Ito. He was shot at in 2007 by an alleged gangster. The incident made Japan further tighten gun control measures. Possession of guns by gangsters and crime groups was made punishable by up to 15 years in prison. Possession of more than one gun was also made a crime. Again, punishable by up to 15 years. Again, long story short, in Japan, gun possession is not an except is an exception. It's not a norm. So a man shooting a former prime minister in the middle of an event with a homemade gun is unfathomable. There are many gun crimes happening abroad, but I never imagined it would happen in Japan and that a former prime minister would die that way. This is not the United States where shooting happens often, so I am in shock. And he was only delivering a speech for the upper house election. We in the Beyond newsroom are also in a state of shock. Back in May, Shinzo Abe had given an interview to us. He spoke with Beyond's managing editor, Palki Sharma Upadhe. We did not know then that this would be his last interview to an international news network. Here is an excerpt from that interview. Mr. Abe, welcome to Beyond. Yeah, so I've been looking forward to this uh, uh, you know, production. I'm very happy to be on the show. Today's newspapers in Japan, and I'm sure elsewhere as well, uh, talk about U.S. President Joe Biden reaffirming his commitment to defending Taiwan, only for the White House to uh, immediately clarify that their policy on Taiwan remains unchanged. Do you believe that the U.S. will militarily intervene if China were to invade Taiwan? Well, I think his comment was intentionally made, uh, but you must forget the fact that uh, he has in the past also made a similar uh, comment that uh, U.S. will be uh, you know, willing to uh, fully defend uh, Taiwan uh, if uh, China were to militarily uh, invade Taiwan. Uh, so, um, you know, that's on the very ground of uh, uh, staying uh, strategically ambiguous in terms of uh, policy. And on the very point that the White House came right out saying, oh, our policy of, um, you know, staying ambiguous uh, uh, strategically uh, has not changed. The fact that they uh, clarify that right after uh, President Biden's comment uh, actually gives us a signal that the U.S. is starting to uh, look at the change of the policy there. And I have been an advocate of changing this amb ambiguous strategy. So let me understand this correctly. You're saying that with yesterday's statement, no matter what the White House has said in clarification, you believe that there is a shift in American policy vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. You know, this is uh, uh, actually a comment uh, given directly from President Biden, and uh, he talked about uh, U.S.'s full commitment to defend uh, Taiwan, uh, even though the White House came out and denied, uh, you know, any overreaction to that, saying that it's the same policy. Uh, but I think essentially what President Biden had said shows the truth, and it was a message to China. Very interesting. Do you believe that Xi Jinping is going to uh, attack Taiwan and take it by force? 
Of course, um, you know, Xi Jinping's policy of one China is out and clear, as it had been stated. And they have clearly shown that uh, uh, forceful um, action uh, by force uh, is one of the options that they might actually ex exercise. But if U.S. were to clearly uh, be in a position to um, interfere uh, with such action of uh, military invasion uh, by China, uh, I think China would uh, consequently have to give up the idea uh, because China certainly doesn't want to go into war with U.S. Let's talk about your relationship with India and Prime Minister Modi. How do you describe it? Of course, uh, we had to stop uh, diplomatic visits uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic uh, for two years. Uh, but uh, you can see the historical visits that we've made back and forth. Of course, um, you know, I was uh, very uh, energetic when, uh, when it comes to strengthening the bilateral relationship during my second uh, administration, but I would go back as far as my first uh, administration where uh, I visited India and I gave a, a parliamentary speech and I talked about the two uh, seas being united. And this became really uh, the concept uh, that led to the Quad and uh, economic uh, uh, collaborations uh, that's after that we have elaborated on. I have always uh, been saying that uh, uh, this bilateral re relationship between Japan and India uh, is the type of bilateral relationship that has the biggest potential of all. You've also had a long association with Mr. Modi uh, in particular and you've known him since the time that he was the Chief Minister of Gujarat. Uh, uh, can you tell us about your engagements and interactions with him? And I ask this because when two leaders meet, there's a lot of talk about personal chemistry. How much does personal chemistry, how, how big a role does it play in international diplomacy? Uh, we've spent uh, quite a bit of time, you know, talking, you know, doing other uh, matters uh, around our diplomatic uh, activities. So relationship goes deep. Uh, our understanding towards national security, uh, the world issues that uh, we need to all uh, collaborate, solve together, uh, are uh, very much, uh, uh, you know, united. And I respect uh, Prime Minister Modi for the fact that uh, uh, he's a quick decision maker. Uh, he has that power to make things happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Shinzo Abe certainly had an eye for foreign policy. He passionately defended democracy in the Indo-Pacific, which is why he was a big supporter of Taiwan. China was not too happy about that. Even now it is raising tensions. Let me tell you what Chinese officials said this week. Our growing comprehensive strength and significant institutional advantages continue to be transformed into efficiency in work related to Taiwan issues and push forward the process of national reunification. In other words, reunification is getting near. The question is, how will that happen? Taiwan will never agree to a peaceful accession, which means war is the only option. Now, China's military is much stronger than Taiwan's. So what's stopping the Chinese? The United States of America. They follow a policy of strategic ambiguity on Taiwan, sort of like, will they, won't they? America has never explicitly said how it will react to an invasion, whether it will defend Taiwan or not, hence the ambiguity. And the only way to find out is if China actually invades. And this confusion has helped maintain the status quo. America accepts the one China policy. China lets Taiwan govern itself. But in the long run, Beijing has different plans. On Thursday, top generals from the US and China spoke to each other. Listen in to what the Chinese general said. I'm quoting, if anyone provokes arbitrarily, it will inevitably be met with a firm counter-strike by the Chinese people. China's military will resolutely defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. The warning was clear. Stop colluding with Taiwan or face the consequences. And how does the United States respond? By sending a sitting senator to Taiwan. Rick Scott is the junior senator from the state of Florida. Earlier today, he arrived in Taipei. 
Now, Scott is a Republican, so this visit symbolizes the bipartisan support for Taiwan in Washington. Uh, I think we've, we all have to, we all realize uh, when we watch what uh, Putin did in Ukraine that the world has changed. We all have to put ourselves in a position that we can make sure we defend the freedom we all believe in. And I think it's important that uh, while each of uh, Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea care about their own uh, security, that the United States and all freedom-loving countries across the world do everything we can to help. Needless to say, China is seething. It sent fighter jets across the Taiwan Strait to intimidate Taipei. Taiwan says the jets crossed the median line. Now, what is the median line? It is the unofficial buffer between China and Taiwan. By crossing it, China was sending out a message. And Taiwan responded by deploying its own air force. Ground-to-air missiles were also deployed to monitor the skies. All of this reveals a more belligerent Chinese policy. It is openly threatening the United States. It is violating Taiwan's air defense zone and counting down to reunification. How must the world respond to this? Perhaps like Shinzo Abe did, by uniting the democracies of the world. And that statement from China was a clear warning, but can Beijing follow through on its threat? What about the crisis within China? China faces two big problems right now, a debt crisis and a resurgence of the Wuhan virus. Let's tell you about them one by one. First, the debt crisis. You must have heard about the problems with Chinese real estate sector. Now, even governments are struggling with their finances in China. Local governments are short on cash. Consider the headlines. Multiple Chinese cities have slashed spending. One of them is Chongqing. It has slashed public spending by $746 million. Earlier this year, the Anhui province decided to cut spending. They want to reduce their expenses by $27 million. But how are they going to do it? The province brought in new rules. Listen to this. The province wanted to cut their printing expenses, so they now require the officials to print on both sides of the paper. Air conditioners are being monitored. Aids are banned from joining meetings to save costs. The city of Fuzhou is taking budget cuts to another extreme. The local officials are no longer buying computers, desks and other supplies. Even notebooks and pencils are not available for the civil servants. How bad are these budget cuts? I have a number for you. Nearly $1 trillion. That's the funding gap. How did this happen? How did the local governments in China run out of money? Well, their sources of funds dried up. The biggest source for revenue for these governments is land sales. This is income generated from sale of land use rights. In April, this revenue plunged by 38%. The Chinese real estate sector has imploded. Several debt-ridden developers have defaulted since last year, so land sales are unlikely to pick up anytime soon. What about other kinds of taxes? Even that revenue has taken a hit. During lockdowns, the Chinese government announced support measures. Tax cuts were given to businesses and individuals. They issued tax refunds as well. Local governments were ordered to pay these out. So they lost money. And now they are finding it hard to sustain. The Wuhan virus could upend China's finances further. There is a fresh outbreak now. Lockdowns have been ordered once again. According to one estimate, at least 114 million people are facing some form of a lockdown. A new variant is fueling this surge, the BA5 Omicron variant. It is the southern cities this time that are reporting a surge. Shenzhen, Macau, Zhuhai, they all have reported cases. In Shanghai, people are worried. They fear the city could be pushed into another lockdown. I think the situation won't improve in the short term. I think it's going to continue and it's getting serious again now. There are some compounds in Shanghai that are being locked down again. There might be another round of big lockdowns. The new cases are because there were people in this karaoke bar that tested positive. A lot of people tested positive. So there are a lot more cases now. They only reported a few of them though, but actually there are probably several more.
People now aren't really scared of COVID anymore. They're scared of being locked down in their homes. They are not scared of the virus, but they are scared of lockdowns. That's what the people of China are worried about. But they might not get a respite from the lockdowns anytime soon. The Chinese president, Xi Jinping, has refused to dump zero COVID. Last week, he gave a speech in Wuhan. Here is what he said. Our country has a large population. Such strategies as herd immunity and lying flat would lead to consequences that are unimaginable. Quote, unquote. Xi Jinping declared zero COVID is the most economic and effective policy for China. The rest of the world is now living with the virus, but it seems like Xi Jinping is not yet ready to step out of the bubble, even though his country is still paying a price for the lockdowns and the restrictions. Our next story is about Elon Musk. He may no longer be buying Twitter. Reports say his planned buyout is in jeopardy. Why? Because of bots. Let me explain. At the time the deal was announced, Musk asserted that 20% of Twitter's user base was made up of bots. He then put the deal on hold, seeking a clarification. Twitter gave Musk access to its internal data, but apparently Elon Musk's team has failed to verify his claim and this has put the deal in peril. Here's a detailed report. The Twitter soap opera is getting more intense. Curtsy the unpredictability of Elon Musk. Earlier this year, he proposed to buy Twitter for $44 billion only to cast doubt on the company's credibility. He said 20% of Twitter's user base was made up of bots. He sought Twitter's internal data to see for himself, even promised to annul the deal if proven wrong. Well, there are still um, a few unresolved matters. Uh, you've, you've probably read about the, the question as to whether the number of um, fake and spam users on the system is less than 5% as Twitter claims, um, which I think is probably not most people's experience uh, on when using Twitter. This was about a month back. A month on, the deal is indeed in peril. A new report says that Musk's Twitter buyout may not happen. The question is, why? The answer is Musk himself. You see, despite being given access to internal data, Musk's team has not been able to verify his claim. It has failed to give an exact figure of bots on Twitter. His team, however, says otherwise. It claims that Twitter has not been able to prove him wrong either. As the war of words escalates, the deal has run into jeopardy. There are strong indications that it may never really happen. Reports claim that the two sides have stopped engaging no talks are being held for the buyout. Discussions around funding the deal have also stopped. This development has unnerved markets. Twitter's shares dropped 4% on Friday itself. So what happens now? Has the deal really gone haywire? Or is this another stunt? We can't say for sure. But if it has, the world's richest man won't be able to walk away so easily. Reports say the Twitter board could file a lawsuit against Musk. It can also demand a $1 billion termination fee. Will Elon Musk comply? Only time will tell. We are a report, we on World is One. Let's now bring you up to date with what's happening in the United Kingdom. Boris Johnson decided to resign. We told you this 24 hours ago. A lot has happened since then. A debate has started involving Johnson's current role. Should Johnson stay on as the interim prime minister or should he leave immediately? Let's first listen in to some reactions. Uh, and he's staying on until we get a new prime minister. Uh, I don't agree, but I think there's no option because you can't run the country without a prime minister and government. Since the Conservatives still have majority in the House, there is really no question of an election. Johnson's replacement will have to be chosen from within the party. The Conservatives will have to elect a new leader who will go on to become the British Prime Minister. And when will that happen? The party is expected to draw up a timeline by Monday. The selection process, though, is clear. It will involve two steps. First, the Tory lawmakers will have to shortlist candidates. The final two will face a ballot. Conservatives aim to have a winner by October. 
Boris Johnson wants to stay on till then. But there are some Tories who do not want to wait that long. They want Johnson to leave immediately and hand over the office to a caretaker prime minister. The next question, who will be the caretaker prime minister? There is no hard rule here. Dominic Raab, the deputy prime minister, is likely to be considered as the ideal candidate for the post. Raab has previously stood in for Johnson when he was recovering from the Wuhan virus. There are also suggestions that former Prime Minister Theresa May could be asked to be the interim leader. After all, she is familiar with the top job. But Johnson does not want to give way to a caretaker PM. He wants to serve till a replacement has been named. Well, look, there's no such thing as a caretaker Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has made it clear he will stand down from his role as party leader and Prime Minister when his successor is chosen. This was James Cleverly. He is a part of Johnson's new cabinet. That's right. The Prime Minister named a new cabinet even after his resignation to fill in the vacancies resulting from the mass quitting. What powers does Boris Johnson have currently? Johnson's government agreed to deliver on pre-agreed policies and the manifesto commitments. The Downing Street spokesperson said that Johnson will not be making any big changes, especially on tax and spending fronts. This is John Major. He is a senior member of the Conservative Party, also Britain's former Prime Minister. Major released a letter saying it is quote-unquote unwise and insustainable for Johnson to stay in office for up to three months. Other popular faces like former ministers Nick Gibb, George Freeman have joined this call. Another Tory MP wrote on Twitter that Johnson has to go and go means go. Johnson and his men do not agree. Well, let's think about the alternative. The Prime Minister has said he is standing down when his replacement is chosen. That is now set. That process is happening. I don't think that it would be appropriate for us, whether we're around the Cabinet table or in any other part of the British government, just to kind of down tools and say, actually, you know what, we're not going to do anything until the new boss is in place. We have a duty and our duty is to govern. Experts, however, fear that the situation is not workable, that Johnson is not cut out to be a lie -low and serve as an interim prime minister. I think, however, there is a problem with Boris Johnson in the sense that as a caretaker, you're really expected to practically say or do nothing, just keep the ship of state afloat. Uh, and Boris Johnson doesn't strike me as a natural candidate for that kind of role. And of course, I think there is actually quite a lot of antipathy, frustration, hostility now within the Conservative Party to Boris Johnson, given what he's put them through. Uh, and I suspect some of them will want him gone straight away. And to be honest, I think a lot of the public will want to see him gone straight away. Um, you know, they don't want to see him hanging around like a bad smell in Downing Street. So what happens till October is anybody's guess. The jury is also out on what happens in October. Who will replace Boris Johnson as the British Prime Minister? Will it be former Chancellor Rishi Sunak, former Health Secretary Sajid Javid? Will it be the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, the Trade Minister Penny Mordaunt, Chancellor Nadeem Zahavi, Conservative MP Jeremy Hunt, or will it be someone else? With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Gravitas. We're leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching.